Uh, and the, <clears throat> the, the key here is not really relying on dedicated connectivity, just a, such as, you know, dedicated fiber links from, you know, venues and things like that to, you know, uh, sort of uh, internet that is widely available to public. Uh, and this was a segment that was already gaining traction, you know, a few years back. And just like many things, the pandemic has sort of propelled this into being a very, very mainstream, uh, you know, use case uh, because folks are not where they would previously be in studios with dedicated satellite trucks or, or bandwidth connections and things like that. Uh, what they are here is, what they have here is, you know, a home environment and just like everybody else, they've had to make it work. So um, the couple of uh, areas where this is growing heavily, uh, it is affecting traditional broadcast, traditional production. There's no doubt about it, right? You have a news event and you have contributors working from home. Uh, they aren't able to come to a studio and, and, and come with a, a regular network infrastructure and broadcast infrastructure. Uh, so that's traditional broadcast, whether that is, you know, folks contributing uh, from remote feeds to folks operating, as in, you know, your directors or your producers, and not everybody was able to come back uh, in full capacity. So they had to, you know, do some monitoring at home, make decisions uh, from home as well. So uh, that that was the, the traditional broadcast space. And then there is the other spaces like you know, e-games or e-sports, right? So in e-sports, you've got players uh, who are playing video games from home that are being broadcast to the rest of the world. So what they have at home is only public internet. So the key here is lossy networks, the, the, the availability. It's not a satellite truck. It's not a 10 gig fiber or 25 gig fiber. It's not Verizon's or, or, or other telecos, uh, you know, dedicated networks. It's public internet. That is what we have available as a pipe. So that brings a number of challenges, right? The first challenge is sending content over this lossy network. So the technologies that are are available or they were becoming available, uh, gained huge popularity during the pandemic was uh, protocols like SRT or RIST. These are alliances, SRT belongs to a particular company, but it's open source so anybody can adopt it. Or RIST, which is part of an alliance, these are protocols to retransmit packets over the internet. And it's a very simple uh, you know, thing to understand the technology behind it is obviously very sophisticated. It's retransmission of packets. When you have crappy networks, you are going to try to send information across. Some of that information is going to get lost. The other side will request the information back again. What that means is you're going to have latency because if you're asking for packets to be retransmitted, you're going to have latency on your on your signal. So that's the transmission over the internet. So that brought two other challenges because of the lossy networks. And one is latency, right? So you have very high latency through these systems, which makes these feeds almost useless in live production or actually very, uh, you know, sort of difficult to process. If you're interviewing someone and you hear their, you know, end of their sentence like three seconds, after you're just kind of you know not in the flow of things there so latency and then if they were trying to do better latency then they had higher bandwidths and if they go with you know lower uh, higher latency their quality was getting really crappy so the combination of high quality and low latency was the biggest challenge thus far uh, in addition to you know having better form factors sort of you know uh being able to um you know, put them in your in your home office so it does. It has to be fanless because if you have a loud, you know, fan making noise under your desk, you're gonna lose your mind in in a few hours uh, with that thing. So, so these are some of the challenges that were presented, and and the industry 
responded to it very well. I believe that there is a number of solutions out there in the market. Uh, some came from, okay, we are an internet transport company and we'll make an encoder or a decoder. Some were, we make an encoder and decoder, we'll start making an internet uh, transport protocol onto our encoder decoder. Some were, we're only software, so you're just sending signals to the cloud and we're gonna be only dealing with the cloud, so you have to go find some stuff for the edge hardware solutions. Uh, so there's like different ways to get this done. And Ebert's responded to this with a brand new series called XPS. Uh, and our focus was and is high quality at that low latency. So the differentiation between this, anybody who's contributing over the internet is they're, they're, they're you know, sort of uh, starving for this combination of maintaining really good signal at a low, low latency, um, uh, you know, throughput. So, so that's XPS for you. I just want to take a moment here and, and ask if anybody has a question regarding the protocols or or just a challenge in, in, in overall uh, in this segment. Okay. So so that being said, how did how did Ebert respond to that and what is really XPS stands for? Uh, so the XPS is an encoder decoder streaming platform and the word streaming gets used because a lot of this is also fueling the cloud production so when production is happening in the cloud or the other side of it is remote production where you're not sending your trucks out or you're not sending your full production staff on this venue but you are bringing content back to a centralized location where you're doing your production. So that gave you know, birth to a lot of companies who are offering remote production as a service. So what they do is let's say there's a golf tournament in Florida, they'll send out cameras, they'll send out encoders and that's it. The cameras will connect to the encoders, they will stream it over low bandwidth signals. All the content will come back to a centralized location and you know, New York, DC, wherever, and that's where it gets produced and then gets sent back. So what that means is you have same operators able to produce multiple shows in a matter of a day because they're co-located. So that brings your cost down significantly. And that was already in works. Remy or uh, remote production was something that was already in works before pandemic and pandemic again just helped accelerate it. Uh, even now with venues, what are we seeing with venues is, uh, you know, they are, uh, you know, there, there are no trucks out there. So they are, you know, responsible for producing some of the content and sending out well, for small, you know, soccer leagues or things like that or schools and et, et cetera. Or they're responsible for sending the content raw to a remote production uh, facilities where it gets produced and then and distributed. So XPS is that it serves that encoding decoding streaming market uh, Everts has a, a large number of solutions for remote production or cloud production our bravo series is cloud production centric so you're switching in the cloud graphics in the cloud you know play out storage everything is happening in the cloud but you need to get the content up into the cloud and that's where xps comes in xps uh, is your cloud on-ramp platform so whether you're bringing in hd or 3g and you need to take it up into the cloud with a number of different protocols xps is going to serve that again it's ultra low latency at a really high quality and that's what gets people excited about xps everts is, is not known for making the cheapest encoders but everts is definitely known for making some of the best quality uh, encoders and we're bringing that expertise to a low cost XPS platform that is able to give you that in this competitive space and this is very high density platform we're looking at high density signals because you know you've got a couple of cameras you've got you know a return feed and things like that uh, you need the platform to be able to handle multiple signals if you do a one channel per box 
then you need lots of these boxes to do a decent size remote production. Whereas with XPS, you've got high density. It is H.264 and HEVC compliant at 422.10 bit. That's key. We see a lot of stuff in the market that is 420.8 8 bit, which is not really production grade sampling. So with XPS, you've got high end contribution at 422.10 bit. This is the key here. It has native support for standard UDP, IP, SRT, RIST, and RTMPS support. So if you wanted to go live on a YouTube feed, you can go straight from this encoder to a YouTube platform and you can start streaming. Uh, or if you're just bringing a remote you know, cameraman uh, feed back in over internet, you can use SRT or RIST. And we're part of both of those alliances. And remember I said that, you know, you can't have really a fan running. So that's where standalone fanless options come into play that are just simple throw down boxes. You plug into your HDMI and you're ready to go. Uh, so you plug in your HD signals and then and connect to your Wi-Fi router at home and you're good to go. The other key advantage that Evers brings to this table is its centralized control and management. See, what happens in situations like these is you've got a bunch of these remote devices around remote studios or remote contributors, but these folks are non-technical, right? You can't expect a, 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 a you know a, a person who's you know contribute as an interview to a to a segment to come in and, and, and utilize a, uh, you know, a, a sophisticated piece of equipment. With XPS, you don't have to worry about that. You ship the gear out, you can centrally control it from your own facility and manage it and change settings on it and things like that. So with Evers Magnum and View, the software solutions, you're able to centralize the control and management of these devices. So what are the problems that this, this you know, segment that it's solving. Number one, it has to be low cost. Folks are not looking for $10,000 a channel. Folks are looking for thousands of dollars a channel, it's a few thousand. So that's where this, this fits in. But keeping the cost low, you still have to have a really good latency and yet keep the quality high, right? So, and, and, and I put these in a sequence because this is how the priority goes. If you're $10,000 a channel, no matter how low your latency is or how high your quality is, it's not gonna fit the space. So it has to be competitive. Once it's competitive, if it's better latency, it seems to trump the quality today. Uh, and then it has to still be high quality because the feeds are not originating from, you know, uh, you know, a very, uh, you know, high fidelity sort of camera sometimes. So, Folks are willing to compromise a little bit on quality, but maintaining a really low cost and a really low latency. Like if you compare the solution to some of our high-end contribution encoders, you can see that those encoders are worth the money, but folks are not looking to pay that much. So this is the, the sort of the hierarchy of cost, latency, and quality. And then they maintain, uh, you know, low bandwidth, lossy networks for example, public internet. So that's a big problem. Folks do not have direct connectivity in their houses and their homes and their uh, you know uh, places uh, of work. So they are using public internet, which is another challenge, another problem. Then you've got non-technical end users. So it's addressing that. You have to have compact uh, form factors because again, you don't have rec rooms and folks, uh, you know, working spaces. So you have to have compact versatile form factors. And again, centralized control and management is key. So let me give you a preview of some of the offerings, right? So this is what we call the XPS Edge, a very simple throwdown box, which has a DC in. You plug in your HD SD camera feeds, and you've got, uh, you know, streaming out over SRT or RIST or any of the other internet protocols, and you're streaming within a matter of minutes. Then, uh, I don't know if we've ever done a, a presentation of, on the platform we call Scorpion, which is essentially a family of throwdown enclosures. And they come in different sizes. We call them Scorpion 2, Scorpion 4, 
Scorpion 6, and then Scorpion 18, which means the number of different modules it can take. And then we made an XPS module for the Scorpion family, which means with the Ebert's mentality of things being different modules, you can add in different modules for different functionality. So with XPS available in Scorpion, you can do your encoding, but you can also do all the other applications as well that a Scorpion can offer. So intercom, tally, you know, getting something to, you know, your, your a remote camera operator is, is contributing in a live show and he's getting a tally high on, on his camera through Scorpion. So that's kind of a thing you can almost, uh, you know, connect as if the studio was connected to the facility, even though it's remote. And then we've got the, the chassis based modules that are high density and you can have 14 of these uh, modules. So you can do like up to 56 paths in a three RU. So these are really high density centralized location uh, solutions. I'll just take a quick moment here as well and see if there are any questions uh, or, or clarifications guys would want uh, at this stage. Yes, this is Derek. I just wanted to confirm uh, that you also support 420 in your own coding. I know some of your local network-based devices don't support 420, and you mentioned 422. Just wanted to confirm that you have the other ones available. Yes, so, yes, so I, I would, yes, uh, and the representation was almost as if it was a a superset. So if you have the sampling at 422, 10 bit, all configurations below that 4228 bit, 4208 bit uh, are supported as well. Correct. Thank you. Any other questions at this point? Okay. So I'll, I'll continue along. Um, and then we uh, introduced another uh, module we call XPS Reflector. And this is going to be a little bit uh, sort of, you know, uh, hard to follow. So, so, so bear with me. Um, when you have SRT or streams going over public internet, they are unicast, which means they are destined for a single destination. Let's take an example. You and generate a mosaic in the facility, and it's a three by three mosaic, and you want to send it to your operator at home. Perfect. You put an XPS encoder on one side, you put an XPS decoder on the other side, both are connected to public internet, and that operator can start seeing the mosaic instantly. Now, that's perfect. You don't need anything in the middle, it's point to point. But now imagine that mosaic has to not only go to one operator, but 10 operators. In the SDI world, we would use an SDI router or a DA. In the IP world, we used to use IP multicast to just send it to 10 separate operators in that facility. Now, because all these 10 operators are sitting at home, they are connected to public internet. Over public internet, you cannot send multicast streams you have to send unicast streams that are destined for a single destination. So if you wanna send one stream to 10 operators, you actually need to generate 10 copies of it with 10 separate destination addresses so that it can go to the 10 separate operators. XPS Reflector is that. It is on-prem or cloud gateway. It is, in simple words, a cloud DA, okay? It takes in one SRT internet stream and makes it as many as you want, or vice versa. It can take in from multiple sources, bring it to a single destination. So it's got flexible inputs and outputs. I'll tell you what I mean by that in a second. It can take in various different input standards and output standards. In addition to just being a DA, it has audio video processing on it, has transcoding on it, has monitoring on it. And that's a good example of, of the block diagram. Basically, if you have a reflector application running in the cloud, you can give it SRT and your destination could be something else and not SRT. 
you can use reflector to convert that protocol you have a camera that's bringing in 2110 you can bring it to srt using reflector so reflector is this multi input multi output application that can serve as like a swiss army knife to basically take in any standard that that's possible give out any standard that is possible that you need in addition to that it can add multiple processing layers on top of it so you're able to utilize additional processing on top of it so let's take an example of some applications right so you've got 4k field contributions so you could bringing in 4k signals from the field remote production return feed monitoring that's the mosaic example i just gave you remote collaboration again multiple people working on a same project but they're all remote a director is making a call on some graphics things like that cloud production where everything is going up into the cloud so remote production let's take an example of that you've got at home talent you've got venue you've got an operator sitting at home you've got your broadcast center what do we have at home maybe a camera signal the guy is just you know, contributing to this show, uh, you know, just commenting or something. Uh, at venue, you've got a couple of cameras from the field. And the operator is, let's say it's a replay operator. So he needs to get the content in, do the replay and send the content back. And in the broadcast center, everything else is happening, whether that is switching or, or, or transport. And the connectivity between all of them is just a wide area network. So how will we make this work? Well, we'll make it work by sending at home talent an XPS Edge encoder. He will start streaming out his content right away. We'll send a Scorpion chassis out to the venue with XPS modules in it. And that can start streaming out right away. We'll send a, a XPS to the operator and see what the difference here is the XPS modules can be configured to be bi-directional. They can be encoders and decoders on the same unit. So it doesn't need two separate boxes, but except one unit that can serve bi-directional. And then all that content can hit the broadcast center. This is where optionally we can install XPS reflector to normalize the content or hit the decoder encoder frame directly to feed your broadcast center infrastructure. That would be a typical application that XPS can handle. If everything was going up into the cloud, then SRT uh, is being used to get things up into the cloud at low bandwidth. You can just use XPS modules all around to get the content up into the cloud and back down. So this is a typical example of cloud production. What are our advantages uh, in this space? Our advantages is right off the bat, we're la lower latency with better quality. Our control system is our advantage. You know, when you're talking about these systems, you're not talking about, hey, I gotta know the IP address of every box, but except you can use Magnum to manage and control the entire system. We have view to control uh, the operator interface and make routes and things like that. We have versatile form factors. And most importantly, this is a very cost effective uh, solution. So in, 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 in summary, you've got a very unique challenge with this pandemic and I think post pandemic as well is where people wanna bring in content from anywhere and be able to add it to their production transport system. However, we don't have the luxury of dedicated fiber or, or, or satellite paths. So this will, what will happen is uh, folks will look for some cost-effective solutions to be able to, to bring in their programming from anywhere and send it to anywhere. And solutions like the XPS utilizing, you know, versatile inputs, versatile codex h264 hgbc even jpeg access on the roadmap and versatile output standards you know ip udp uh, rtmps srt wrist various standards they can start contributing from anywhere 
and start operating from anywhere. That's pretty much the end of my presentation, guys. Uh, I know we're not exactly an hour, but I didn't intend to be too long anyway. So I'll take any questions that we might have at this point. All right, Harch, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, I'm gonna start off with a question for you. And that would be, how do you compare this to like the existing units that are out there that there are competitors um, like TVU, LiveU, and Teradek? Um, just uh, a couple of comparison contrast. Right, that, that's a good point. And like I said in the beginning, that this is not uh, a unique offering from a standpoint of we're doing something magical here. Uh, the the clear contrast uh, folks are going to see is in that first point I mentioned, which is we're going to bring in high quality. Right off the bat, if there is no clear visual difference, I think we're going to pick up our rocks and leave because this is the space is already working. What is the real challenge folks have? That's they're looking for improved quality at a better latency. And second of all. Uh, there is another need uh, where, you know, in the beginning they were like, yeah, let's just put it a Teradek or a high vision or something and let's just get going. And then they realized they have five, six, eight of those and the controlling them is becoming a nightmare, configuring them every time. So they're looking for something more centralized and that's where Everts Magnum comes into play. Folks that are already pro Everts and have an Everts ecosystem benefit from this instantly when they plug in the device and Magnum discovers it and now you have configuration all centralized to where they go, oh, what was the IP address of that box? Oh yeah, okay, I gotta change and log into its web page and make its changes. So that's, we're finding that some folks are, 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 are really seeing that as an advantage. Uh, so besides that, uh, I think just the, the quality that that uh, you know Everse is known for uh, it, it, it is what will stand out. Yeah. And the key here is same cost, Mark. We're not going to say you're going to pay more for high quality, low latency signals. We're going to say you have a better offering at the same price. All right, thank you very much for that comparison. I was I appreciate that. No problem. I had a question. And I, I posted it to the chat box, maybe you didn't see it. Two things, how do you define low latency? And number two, um, I assume that's based on the GOP length since you're using um, uh, HEVC or H.264. So, so, right. so what? What is low latency? How do you define that? What do you consider to be low latency well, and, and how are you achieving I, it? Right, so I think it's, it, yes, that's why you know there's no number published because it is a subjective thing and it, it is the, you know, application specific. But if we take in any scenario, right? We say uh, it's uh, you know a 3G signal at 15 megabits per second, HEVC over SRT, a reliable network, what is your latency? And then we can say, and it's your encoder and decoder on both sides. We can say, well, we're going to be within, you know, a couple of hundred milliseconds. What is the competition? You know, five, six, eight hundred milliseconds. So that's a significant difference. But if we say no, the 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 encoder, the competition's published latency is back to back, whereas yours is in a different scenario, then it's different. Uh, the GOP length is adjustable, but when we go to ultra low latency modes, it's not adjustable because we're achieving the maximum latency by following the best GOP length possible to get to that latency. But you don't publish that Which length? Which is 16, I believe. I think it's 16, Pete. Oh, 16 frames? 16, yeah, frames for okay. GOP, yeah. Okay, well, that would be very short. Of course, with a 16-frame GOP, your your bit rate's going to be still pretty high, though. That's that's why, Pete. It's hard to get the combination. So what we do is this, right? The way I approach this, and I, I think I've had good success with this, is what I say doesn't mean nothing for folks until they go, give it to me a pair. In my scenario, I've got something else that I'm running that I had to get during the pandemic. And let me see if you really perform better. I will be visually able to look at it 
and tell if it's good. The picture's getting there faster and it looks pretty good. And I think with that demonstration, we've had 100% success so far, 100% success that the likes of TVU or uh, Terror Deck, uh, these guys are good enough. But when we talk about maintaining that quality and latency combination for, for applications, uh, Ever stands out. And what did you say the maximum resolution? Uh, you said the color, the color resolution is is what four two two, and then what's the maximum resolution? Ten bit. Yeah. What's the maximum resolution? So 422. Is it? Yeah, four K. All right, so it's forty ninety six by twenty one sixty ten bit. It's it's thirty eight forty by. So it's not the. It's ultra HD. It's thirty eight forty twenty one sixty ten bit four two two. Yes, ten bit okay. four two two correct. Uh, Mark asked how many streams encoder can do. So if you're looking at 1080p, it can do four paths of full, full HD 1080p. And if you look at, um, uh, th those would be, no, that would be part of the stream. So if you have a main and a backup channels, then they'll be all part of the four channels. All right, so I'm Oh, okay. Go ahead. No, I'll just say I just did the math on that. That works out to um, uncompressed 3840, 2160, 10-bit, um, 422. Oh, I didn't, never mind. I didn't, do the, I didn't do the frame rate. I'm just running here on a calculator. Um, sorry to be a pain in the ass about this, but that's this is a question I always have to ask. So I assume that it can do 5994 and 60 hertz, correct? Correct. All right, let me run that number again. I'll pop back in. Go ahead with the other. Okay, Arj, I'm going to ask a question. What, if you're using the cloud solution, is there an increase in latency from going to the cloud? And I'm, I'm assuming there is, especially when you start to go and and do a one-to-many situation. What uh, what's the increase in latency at that point? It it's actually you know like the SRT um, adds about 60 milliseconds of latency. Uh, and I think retransmission is is just around that, and it doesn't doesn't exponentially go higher. It just it's one time. Once you go through the reflector layer, you can do it, you know, a hundred times. You're gonna still have that same latency. You're not gonna have hundred times the latency increase because we're reading it from the shared memory. Um, and and going through the cloud uh, or going through the public internet, the, the the latency is there from the SRP and and how lossy your network is. Like if you're having, you know, fifty percent. Uh, really transmission rate that's that's just gonna be crazy but that's not what most people have most people have five to ten percent uh so that can that can vary so a lot of people when they measure the latency they say take the network latency out of the picture which then makes the latency numbers um kind of you know uh not really useful but they can still get an idea of what the encoder and decoder pair is doing and we could do you know 100 milliseconds in that space so so we're really able to offer, uh, uh, you know, compared to six, seven, eight hundred milliseconds of, uh, of latency. Great, thank you. Does anybody else have any other questions for Harsh? Okay. Okay. Well, at this point, I think I'm going to uh, close the Q&A session. So, Harj, thank you very much for the presentation. It uh, yep. was very interesting and uh, uh, gave us a lot of thought. I mean, I had already, after looking through some of this before, I'd reached out to to Chuck um, probably about a week ago, maybe just a couple of days ago. I forget. Weeks and days kind of go together right now. But uh, about the Scorpion and some of the stuff with there. So, it's very interesting. And being somebody that I've, I've tried a couple of different things with uh, with TVU, LiveU, and, and Teradek, and the latency is definitely the biggest you know issue that along with quality. And if you want to yeah. latency go down, latency go down, quality goes down. Latency goes up, quality goes right. up. Be a thing, yeah. in fact. So and well, I'm a educational and not uh, not uh, broadcast. I do 
have things where the latency is an issue where a professor is remote and has to be remote. Um, and when he wants to talk and interact with the class, that latency needs to be low because otherwise it's, it becomes very annoying on there, especially if you're using other platforms with it to, for communication, like the, the for ubiquity and, and other things to, for Clearcom. So that's a very useful presentation. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening, guys. Uh, take care. Thank you. Thanks, Sarge. Uh, at this point, would anybody else like to bring up anything um, for this meeting? And any thoughts or suggestions on uh, on future webcasts or webinars and topics and subjects that uh, that you would like to to hear presented upon? Okay. All right. Well, with that being said, thing I'll uh, send out another email to everybody with the, with the same questions on it. As we're here to present on on items that uh, and applications that you're interested in, so feel free at any point to email me or any of the other managers to uh, to, to give us your input and what you'd like to hear and webinars you'd like to to see up upon. Um, and also for managers, I'm gonna I'm stop the recording right now.